Good evening, everyone. Dr. Perryman here. Hope you're having a good evening. We're going to talk about uh, chapters 3, 4, and 5, summing up Unit 2. Uh, if you see me taking a drink of something, it would be a diet do. Caffeine choice of online instructors everywhere. Maybe Mountain Dew will give me some endorsement money. Who knows? Yes, good strategic management move on their, on their part. All right, let's get started. In Chapter 3, uh, the title was Assessing the Environmental, the Internal Environment, rather, of the Firm. In traditional approaches of assessing a firm's internal environment, the manager's primary goal would be to determine the firm's relatively, relative strengths and weaknesses, such as the role of the SWOT analysis, wherein a manager analyzes the firm's strengths, strengths God gum, not enough caffeine, and weaknesses as well as the opportunities and threats in the external environment. And as I mentioned in one of my earlier videos, I like to add trends onto that as, a, uh, as an additional T at the end. In this chapter, we discussed why it may be a good starting point, but hardly the best approach for performing a sound analysis. There are many limitations in a SWOT analysis, including the static perspective its potential to oversize the single dimension of the firm's strategy, and the likelihood that the firm's strengths do not necessarily help create value or competitive advantages. We identified two frameworks that serve to complement the SWOT analysis of assessing the firm's internal environment, those being the value chain analysis and the resource-based view of the firm. In conducting the value chain analysis, you first divide the firm into a set of value-creating activities these include primary activities such as inbound logistics, operations, and service, as well as support activities such as procurement and human resource management. Then you analyze how each activity adds value, as well as how the interrelationships among value activities in the firm and among the firm and its customers and suppliers add value. Thus, instead of merely, merely determining the firm's strengths and weaknesses per se, we analyze them in the overall context of the firm and, it, and in its relationship with the customers and suppliers. Mm, pardon me, i.e. the value system. Mm, pardon me. The resource-based view of the firm considers the firm as a bundle of resources, tangible resources, intangible resources, and organizational capabilities. Competitive advantages that are sustainable over time generally arise from the creation of bundles of resources and capabilities. For advantages to be sustainable, four criteria must be satisfied. Rareness, valuable, uh, difficulty in imitation, and difficulty in substitution. If you've got something that's rare, it's valuable, it's hard to imitate it, and it's hard to substitute it then you could see that competitive advantage last for a while. Such an evaluation requires a sound knowledge of the competitive context in which the firm operates. The owners of the business may not capture all of the value created by the firm. The appropriation of value created by the firm between the owners and the employees is determined by four factors. The first one, employee bargaining power, then employee replacement cost, employee exit costs, and the manager borrowing power. And an internal analysis of the firm would not be complete unless you evaluated its performance and made appropriate comparisons. Determining the firm's performance requires an analysis of its financial situation as well as a review of how well it is satisfying the broad range of stakeholders, including customers, employees, and stockholders. We also discussed the concepts of a balanced scoreboard and strategy map with four perspectives uh, that must be addressed. Those being, oh, pardon me, the customer, internal business, innovation learning, and financial. Central to the balanced scoreboard is the idea that the interests of various stakeholders can be interrelated. We provided examples of how indicators of employee satisfaction led to higher levels of customer strength customer satisfaction, which in turn led to higher levels of financial performance. Thus, improving the firm's performance does not need to involve making trade-offs among different stakeholders. 
Assessing the firm's performance is also useful if it's evaluated in terms of how it changes over time, compares with industry norms, and compares itself with key competitors. An index to the chapter discussed how the internet-based businesses and incumbent firms are using digital technology to add value. Such technology-enhanced capabilities are providing new means with which firms can achieve competitive advantages. Again, thank you, Mountain Dew. All right. Then, Chapter 4, Recognizing a Firm's Intellectual Assets Moving Beyond the Firm's Tangible Resources. Firms throughout the industrial world are recognizing that the knowledge worker is key to success in the marketplace. However, we also recognize that human capital, although is vital, although vital, is still only necessary, but is still only a necessary but sufficient condition for creating value. We began the first section of the chapter by addressing the importance of human capital and how it can be attracted, developed, and retained. Then we discussed the role of social capital and technology in living, leveraging human capital for competitive success. We pointed out that intellectual capital, the difference between the firm's market share and its book value, has increased significantly over the past few decades. This is particularly true for, firm, for firms in knowledge-intensive industries, especially where there are relatively few tangible assets such as software development. The second section of the chapter addressed the attraction, development, development, and retention of human capital. We viewed these three activities as a three-legged stool. That is, it's difficult for firms to be successful if they ignore or, uns or are unsuccessful in any one of those three activities. Among issues that we discussed in attracting human capital were hiring for attitude and training for skill. The value of using social networks to, attra to attract human capital. In particular, it is important to attract employees who can collaborate with others uh, given the importance of collective efforts such as teams and tasks for task forces. With regard to developing human capital, we discussed the need to encourage widespread involvement throughout the organization, monitor process and track the development of human capital, and evaluate human capital. Among the issues that were widely practiced in evaluating human capital is the 360-degree evaluation system. Employees are evaluated by their superiors, peers, direct reports, and even internal and external customers. Finally, some mechanisms for retaining human capital are employees' identification with the organization's mission and, mission and values, providing a challenging and stimulating work environment, the importance of financial and non-financial rewards and incentives, and providing flexibility and amenities. A key issue here is that the firm should not overemphasize financial rewards. After all, if individuals are going to join an organization for money, they're also likely to leave the organization for money. With money as the primary motivator, there's little chance that employees will develop firm-specific ties to keep them with the organization. We also develop the we also address the value of a diverse work, workforce and two different types of diversity, inherent and acquired. The third section of the chapter discussed the importance of social capital and leveraging human capital. Social capital refers to the network of relationships that individuals have throughout the organization, as well as with customers and suppliers. Such ties can be critical in obtaining both information and resources. With regard to recruiting, for example, we saw how some firms are able to hire groups of individuals in mass who are part of social networks. Social relationships can also be very important in the effective functioning of groups. We address social network theory and point out the relative advantages of the two concepts, closure and brokering relationships. Finally, we discuss some of the potential downsides of social capital, 
Those include expenses that the firm may bear when promoting social and working relationships among individuals, as well as the potential for groupthink, wherein individuals are reluctant to express divergent or opposing views on an issue because of the social pressures to conform. The fourth section addressed the role of technology in leveraging human capital. We discussed relatively simple means of using technology, such as email and networks, where individuals can collaborate by way of personal computers. We also addressed more sophisticated uses of technology, such as sophisticated management systems. Here, knowledge can be codified and reused at very low cost, as we provided examples of firms in the consulting, healthcare, and high technology industries. We also discussed how electronic teams can be effectively used. The fifth section of the chapter addresses key differences between the protection of physical property and intellectual property. The development of dynamic capabilities is clearly one of the best ways to ensure that a firm can protect its intellectual property. Now, I'll take another sip before we start Queen of Fun. I take that back, Chapter 5, not Unit 5, because this is wrapping up Unit 2. Chapter 5, Business Level Strategy, Creating and Sustaining Competitive Advantages. How and why firms outperform each other goes to the heart of strategic management. In this chapter, we identified three generic strategies and discussed how firms are not able to maintain or attain, rather, advantages over competitive competitors, but also to sustain advantages over time. Why do some advantages become long-lasting while others are quickly imitated by competitors? Those three generic strategies, overall cost leadership, differentiation, and focus, those three form the core of the chapter. We began by providing a brief description of each generic strategy or competitive advantage the first examples of firms that have successfully implemented these strategies. Successful generic strategies invariably enhance a firm's position vis-a-vis -vis the five forces of that industry, a point that we stressed and illustrated with examples. However, as we pointed out, there are pitfalls to each of the generic strategies. The sustainability of a firm's advantage is always challenged by cause of imitation or substitution by new or existing rivals. Oh, pardon me. Such competitor moves erode the firm's competitive advantage over time. We discussed the viability of combining or integrating an overall cost leadership and differentiation generic strategies. If successful, such integration can enable a firm to enjoy superior performance and improve its competitive position. However, this is challenging, and managers must be aware of the potential downside risks associated with this initiative. We also discussed the issue of sustainability of a firm's competitive advantage. We used an example of a manufacturing firm, Atlas Door, to illustrate the key concepts of the first five chapters of the book. The concept of industry life cycle is, crit is a critical contingency that managers must take into account in striving to create and sustain competitive advantages. We identified the four stages of the industry life cycle, those being introduction, growth, maturity, and decline, and suggested how these strategies can play a role in the decisions that managers must make at a business level. These include overall strategies as well as relative emphasis on functional areas and value-creating activities. <clears throat> 